Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be listening to the first part of what if Deku was in villain class 1A. If you enjoy, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing down below and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you get notified when videos go live. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. Chapter 1, How Did This Happen? Why are we here again? Kaminari glanced down at Siro, his chin in his hands and his legs swinging over the edge of the building. He glumly stared out at the skyline, the night quiet, for now. Kaminari sighed deeply, I don't know, man. It's one of the big questions isn't it, why are we here? Leaning up against the barricades, he tried to make out his classmates running around below. Why us? I mean, so many of us have been through so much and now we're all stuck here together and... No, Kaminari, you idiot. Siro interrupted suddenly, breaking the peace. Why are we here? We're on a roof in the middle of the night, and you have a bunch of exposed wires. He blinked, oh. Yeah, oh. What was all that about? Did you think I meant, meaning of life or something? Are you okay? Fine. Fine, really, just, thinking about stuff. Do you, want to talk about it? No, it's. Kaminari froze, his eyes catching the glimmer of a flashlight below, turning on and off. Maybe later, he finished. That's the signal, right. How am I supposed to know? That's what I was asking you in the first place. I forgot. Kaminari hurried back to the wires, I'm short-circuiting the building. You can't just stick your hands in there. Siro hissed, backing away from the electronics that Sato had ripped out for them earlier. You'll short-circuit yourself. And that's why you're here. Kaminari grinned, giving him a thumbs up. See you on the other side. And with a shout and a flash, the lights went out. Kaminari stumbled back from what was once the fuse box, murmuring nonsense with that blank look upon his face. Siro simply sighed, taping his friend's arms together and hauling him over to the edge of the building, where they could obsile down. This is going to be a long night. This is going to be a long year, Midoriya muttered to himself, staring up at Yue. The massive, H-shaped building towered before him. The sunlight reflected in the windows. He had to avert his gaze from the blinding light, it was painful to look at. The heat was bound to be stifling in there, with all that glass. Their air conditioning better be good. The gazes from the other students already resting on him were bad enough. He ducked his head, marching forwards and trying not to catch anyone's eye. That's it, he was inside. Home for the next, who knows how long. Midoriya certainly didn't. For Midoriya, was a member of Yue's infamous Class 1A. In a world of superpowers, also known as quirks, those who held the greatest strength, rose above the rest and were hailed as heroes, holding back those who used their powers for ulterior motives, the villains. And of course, with rising crime rates, schools were established to raise heroes to fight for society. But Yue was unlike any other hero school. There were three years here, but the first year was the smallest. In the second year, Class A and B were both hero classes, with C and D in general studies, etc. But the first year was half that size. Class B was the only hero class, C for general studies, D for support, and E for business. So, where did that leave Class A, you might ask? Class A was the villain class. One day, some official looked at the data, and decided that most villains started on the road to darkness when they were only teenagers, like Midoriya and it was only getting worse. There were kids with dangerous quirks, kids who fell in with the wrong crowd, kids manipulated and turned against the heroes, kids who tried to be the hero themselves, illegally. That official said that, well, they could train more heroes to combat the growing crisis, or they could hit the problem at its source. Find a way to stop people from taking that dark road at all. UA was a prestigious school. Its entrance exams were tough, and classes just as challenging, but it produced outstanding heroes. If you couldn't get in for the first year, possibly because you didn't have a flashy quirk or the skill to use it yet, you had a chance to enter for the second year, providing you had some outstanding references and grades. You could even transfer from UA's general studies department, if you proved you had what it takes. And then UA talked to that official, or group of officials, and said, if we take in a class of delinquents from across the country, we could train them alongside our brightest, with heroic teachers and outstanding resources, and turn them around. 
the program was a success. Some of the greatest support tech designers had graduated from UA's Class A outstanding underground heroes had been produced, and overground ones too. Then let's not forget businessmen and women who could twist the market around their pinky finger with the world of experiences they had gained from UA and beyond. But if you failed Class A, that was the end of the road for you. You'd be sent back to whatever hole they pulled you out of. Most often, Juvi. Class A was your last hope. And Midoriya, he didn't belong here. Because in a world of superhumans, Midoriya was the opposite, he didn't have a quirk, nothing at all. Quirkless, useless, pitiful Deku. And here he was, the red bands of Class A painted onto his blazer, the large number 18 on his back. One of 20 would be villains and thugs. Why was he one of them? Why was he here again? The room was deadly quiet as he slid the door open. He wasn't the last to arrive, which he was thankful for. More so when he realized Kikin hadn't turned up yet. He sat down on the desk, which had a new PE kit marked 18 sitting on top. 18 basically seemed to be his new name now. He stared blankly at the front of the room, waiting for the dreadful day to begin. More arrived, slowly but surely. Each had their own remarkable story to tell, Midoriya was sure. Kikin arrived eventually too. Midoriya quickly turned away from his furious stare as he stomped across the room and threw himself into the seat in front of him. 17. Great. Just great. Of course, Kikin had to be number 17. Why couldn't he have been? 1. He always saw himself as number 1 anyway. I'm going to be the greatest hero this world has ever seen. Blah, 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 stupid Deku, go die in a ditch, blah, blah, blah. Ha, good luck with that now. You'll have a black mark on your record for the rest of your life. Even if you do make it into class B next year, the world will always see you for your time in class A. You'll never be number one. Never. The time ticked by. The classroom filled up to the brim, every seat occupied. Midoriya didn't dare to glance around at his classmates, if he could even call them that. This was nothing more than a prison, at least, that was what it felt like. The trackers strapped around their ankles didn't help to convince them otherwise. Midoriya wasn't the only one who flinched when the door was finally flung open again. Outside, was a man who couldn't possibly be their teacher, right? But he waltzed in regardless, long, greasy, black hair, tired eyes and dull clothing, a bright yellow sleeping bag slung over his shoulder and a white scarf around his neck. He let the sleeping bag drop to the floor, the soft thud filling the silence. Good morning, his low, gravelly voice greeted them. I am Mr. Izawa, your teacher. Midoriya felt his sweat drop. For such a tired, done-looking man, he radiated a strange intensity. That didn't stop Midoriya giving him a weird look when he pulled what looked like a fruit pouch from his desk and ate, drank, most of it whilst staring back at them. You all know why you're here, he sighed, tossing the empty pouch into the bin beside his desk, which already had a decent number of packages within it, despite this being the first day of class. Midoriya was tempted to say that, actually no, he didn't understand why he was here. But that would mean speaking out in front of everyone. He wasn't ready for that yet, he had to figure out how this classroom worked first. A prolonged moment of silence reigned over them before Mr. Izawa continued, you can graduate class A at any time. All you need is my approval, and you will be immediately transferred to class C, general studies. But you have to earn it first. Another minute of silence passed as Mr. Izawa looked every one of his students in the eye. Midoriya hated how he lingered on him for a little longer than the others. Pick up your PE kit, the teacher instructed. I'm taking you down to the changing rooms, then I'll meet you out on the green. Everyone got up with varying enthusiasm. Midoriya could already see who they were from the way they walked. How some seemed to cower and shuffle past, how others stood tall, chin raised in defiance, as if saying that this place had no hope in changing them, or perhaps that it was an honor to be considered bad enough to get here, whilst the rest didn't seem that bothered, like they knew they'd end up here anyway. Mr. Izawa followed them from behind, calling instructions out to those in the lead as to which way to go. They'd all individually been toured around the buildings and facilities anyway, that's why they all arrived at different times. Midoriya hadn't been listening or paying attention though. He had been too lost in his own thoughts. Now it looked like he'd get lost in this maze of a school too. With orders to meet him past the door on the other end of the changing rooms, 
Mr. Izawa left them to it, allowing the boys and girls to separate into their respective rooms, and wandering off. Midoriya got changed as quickly as possible, not wanting to be shut in the situation for a second longer than necessary. He just needed to make it through to graduation, however, long that ended up being. Maybe Mr. Izawa would soon see there had been a mistake and let him transfer to general studies. Yeah, he could see himself there, sure, why not? Damn it, Kaken, this is all your fault. Whilst Midoriya scampered towards the exit, he walked straight into terrifying looking number 11. He glared down at him over the top of his blue mask, and a third eye appeared on his tentacle-like hands. Midoriya just laughed nervously and backed away, giving him a wide berth as he made his way towards the door. Aren't you going to get changed, 15, someone suddenly called out. The loud noise made Midoriya jump. He turned around to see bespectacled number 4 waving his arms at this number 15. Midoriya met eyes with 15, and his blood ran cold. There are no cameras here, he said whilst Midoriya backed out of the door. I'm not here to make the hero's life any easier. Midoriya heard nothing more. He marched away, not wanting to get involved, and soon found himself standing by some of the girls, before Mr. Izawa. His mind wandered back to the changing rooms. Student 15, was Shoto Todoroki. Midoriya used to be a fan of heroes. He knew all about him. Well, even if you weren't a fan of heroes, you'd still know about Shoto Todoroki, the son of the number two ranked hero, Endeavor. It was a great scandal. Todoroki was supposedly kidnapped by a scarred villain named Dabi a few years ago. There was massive media coverage over it. When he was finally caught, Dabi slipped through the cracks, and Todoroki had a newfound hatred of heroes, specifically his own father. Of course, he'd end up at UA. Where else would he go? He wasn't exactly a murderer like Dabi, but he was still a villain of sorts. But of course, Midoriya had to end up in his class too. He didn't ask for this. For God's sake, it hadn't even been an hour yet, and this was already a nightmare. Time went by, and most of the other students arrived. But not Todoroki. Eventually, Mr. Izawa went to get the missing student himself. And after way longer than necessary, Todoroki seemingly gave up and got dressed, meeting Mr. Izawa outside and walking as slowly as he could over to the rest of them. Line up, Mr. Izawa sighed, and they did just that. In your number order. A confused minute of shuffling later, and Midoriya found himself between a guy half his height who kept ogling at the girl next to him, and Kikin. Because the universe just hates him. Get used to who you're standing next to, the teacher instructed, whenever you line up, it will be in this order. Be quicker next time. Great. There are three reasons for you being here, said Mr. Izawa, walking up and down the line. Firstly, your quirk could be dangerous. Numbers 1, 2, 7, 10, and 14, we will be working on gaining better control of your abilities. You will graduate when I believe you are no longer a danger to yourself or anyone else. Secondly, Vigilantism. I know it sounds honorable, I know you believe you were doing the right thing, but it is illegal. In the eyes of the law, you are villains, not heroes. Without training, restraint, and skill, you could have caused more problems than you fixed. Numbers 3, 4, 6, 8, and 9, you will graduate once these messages have truly sunk in. He stopped in front of them all, sighing deeply, that makes 10. The other half of you are here for villainous behavior. Argue with me all you want, it won't change a thing. Midoriya clenched his fists. That's what they really thought of him. A villain? That wasn't right, he didn't do anything wrong. It was Kikin who was meant to end up here, not him as well but it had all backfired so horribly. For all the planning and everything he'd thought through, this was not an eventuality he'd even considered. You will graduate when I believe you understand why you ended up here, and when you can see a better path to the future. Well then, Midoriya was going to be stuck here forever. Reach the end of the school year without my approval to move on, and it's an automatic fail. Midoriya gulped. Do I have to explain what that means to you? No one answered. Good. Every single one of my students graduated last year. Let's see if you have what it takes. And then the dreaded words were uttered, quirk assessment, and Midoriya knew that this was the beginning of the end for him. It was bad enough at his old school, Aldera Junior High. It was bound to be worse here, where half of his classmates were basically villains. 
the second they knew he was quirkless, it would start all over again. He'd gone through all that effort into ending it, once and for all, and it had boomeranged right back into his face. Well, at least Kikin was here. Not that Midoriya was particularly thankful for the familiar face. It was more because that was Midoriya's aim. He wanted to get Kikin into class A. His old friend was going to make an excellent hero, that was for sure, and Midoriya had no doubt that Kikin would transfer to class B before long. But he needed to learn a little humility before that. He couldn't be a hero and a tyrant. Kikin was heading straight towards a life where he'd just be a bigger, crueler, meaner version of his middle school self, a bully with power. Class A would teach him the difference, right? With the added bonus of him likely being unable to make the highest hero ranks. Of course, Midoriya never planned that he would also be in Class A. Oh, and I forgot to mention, Mr. Izawa suddenly said, interrupting them as the first two made their way to the start of the sprint exercise. Last place in this assessment will get immediate detention. There was a murmur of complaint that Midoriya didn't dare participate in. And for you, that means helping Class B wash their dishes tonight. Mr. Izawa's terrifying grin made the prospect seem far worse than it probably was. And all of a sudden, Midoriya had a newfound motivation to do well in this test. But that didn't stop Kikin accidentally blowing up in Midoriya's face whilst he used his quirk for extra speed in the sprint. It certainly didn't help when he almost burned through Midoriya's shoes whilst he was supposed to hold his feet down during a sit-up exercise. And Midoriya was most likely still sitting dead last when, in the 800 meters, Kikin tripped him up and Midoriya got a face full of concrete. Midoriya caught Mr. Izawa's gaze after he stood back up, rubbing the blood off the gash in his cheek with the back of his sleeve before he carried on. Somehow, he still didn't come last. Number 17, Mr. Izawa called out before they moved on to the ball toss. Why don't you use my damn name? Kikin hissed. At the moment, you're not acting like someone that deserves it, Mr. Izawa droned with no remorse. Care to explain why you're treating 18 like this? That's a nasty cut on his face and don't think I haven't noticed all the scorch marks on his clothes. Midoriya felt the rest of the class eyes on the back of his head. He kept his gaze on Mr. Izawa. Kakan simply snarled, I'm not doing anything he doesn't deserve. Midoriya didn't say a word, didn't move a muscle, didn't avert his eyes. I know how the two of you ended up here. Neither of you will be going anywhere until you can find a way to work out these differences. Especially you, 17. Well, Midoriya really was going to die here. At least he was taking Kikin down with him. Detention, Mr. Izawa snapped to Kikin. And don't come last, or else you'll be doing two days in a row. Midoriya was 100% prepared for Kikin to immediately take it out on him. Since, once again, it was his fault. But the fact that he just clenched his fists, seething in silence and glaring at him from the corner of his eyes, almost made it worse. The rest of the assessments passed without any problems, which just made Midoriya nervous. Especially when short, purple-haired number 19 ended up scoring incredibly high in that side-to-side -side jumping activity. Midoriya was doomed. He was going to end up in detention with Kikin. It was even more of a punishment. Okay, here are your scores, Mr. Izawa sighed, and with the touch of a button, the leaderboard appeared as a hologram before him. Midoriya winced, preparing himself for the worse, before slowly allowing his eyes to gaze up and find that. He wasn't last. 15. Detention. Next time, put in a little more effort. Todoroki didn't seem so bothered, but Midoriya was relieved. He wasn't last. He was third to last. The invisible girl hadn't done as well as him either. Well, it made sense, considering her quirk didn't give her any advantage in these tests. Although Midoriya couldn't see her, from her clothes, she seemed just a little smaller and weaker than him. Number 20, I expected more from you. I won't let it slide next time. And 19, I'm watching you. Well, that wasn't ominous at all. The tall girl with the ponytail, number 20, glared down at 19, the short, purple boy. Gosh, Midoriya really needed to learn their names. Mr. Izawa handed a note to Midoriya. Head up to recovery girl and get that scratch fixed up. I assume you know the way. Midoriya nodded, even though he didn't at all. His teacher turned back to the rest of them. I need all of you to be trying your hardest if you want a hope in graduating. This is your first warning. What about him? 
19 pointed up at Midoriya, who flinched at the sudden proclamation, he didn't even use his quirk. 18 doesn't have a quirk. Well, that just happened. You barely scored higher than him, 19, I don't know why you seem so smug about it. You're on thin ice. 18 put in more effort than most of you. Any bigotry towards someone's quirk, or lack of one, will not be tolerated here. Do you understand? Midoriya blinked. He, hadn't expected that. I said, do you understand? There was a chorus of, yes, sir. Before they were finally dismissed. Midoriya almost ran back to the changing rooms. He got changed so quickly that most hadn't even made it inside before he was gone, ready to roam the maze in search of recovery girl. Maybe, this won't be so bad after all. But that was only the beginning. Chapter 2, Who Are You? Kakan being in detention was a blessing to Midoriya. At the end of the day, him and Todoroki were escorted out of the Class A dorm, Heights Alliance, a pretty name for a place which was essentially a prison, and Midoriya was left in peace. Prior to which, they were shown around the dorms, given an extensive list of rules, no turning off the lights around student 14, no touching anything marked with a pink number 2, no leaving the dorm after 9, and allowed to unpack. Another good thing for Midoriya, was that for once, the numbering system hadn't been used when assigning rooms. This was likely because of the need to separate the girls from the boys. But Midoriya was simply happy that he wasn't next to Kukin. It wasn't so great that two out of the five students with dangerous quirks were on his floor. He had a sign stapled to the back of his door, explaining that if he dared turn off the lights in the corridor at night, student 14's shadow monster quirk could lash out and potentially kill them all, oh, and his neighbor, student 1, had a laser in his navel which could leak out at any given notice, have fun with that. And his other neighbor was perverted student 19, who kept trying to talk to him and Midoriya really would rather not encourage that friendship, especially after how he'd called him out on his quirklessness in front of the entire class. Midoriya flopped down onto his bed with a sigh. He'd unpacked everything already, from the various boxes that had been brought up to his room earlier in the day. He didn't bring too much, just the norm, clothing, bathroom necessities, stationery and an array of notebooks. He wasn't allowed his laptop or phone. He didn't bring any posters to make his room look a little less drab either. He used to have a lot of hero merchandise, which made his bedroom look like a small shrine. He didn't bring any of it because, well, it didn't exist anymore. A few months ago, he'd sold most of it off and thrown the rest in the trash, ripping the posters angrily off the wall and bringing some of the plaster along with it, but that was the fault of Blue Tack. His notebooks used to be full of hero analyses, but he didn't have the heart for it anymore. He left all 13 of those at home, including the one with the number one heroes, All Might's, signature inside that Kukin had burned up, on the day it all went wrong. His new notebooks were all completely empty, he supposed he should find something to use them for. And well, a life full of nothing but analysis directed him towards one thing. This was why Midoriya picked up the first, empty notebook he could reach, and began his work. Before long, 20 double page spreads were set up, one for each student in his class. Now, he just needed to find the information to fill it up with. What did he know already? Well, there was him, Kukin and Todoroki, those were the only names he could add. Oh, and there was what Mr. Izawa had said, certain numbers being here for dangerous quirks, some for vigilantism, and the other half for villains. Midoriya didn't think he had many talents, but even he couldn't deny that his memory was excellent. Ah, and then they had warnings for each of the dangerous quirk students. On the first page, he made a quick contents section. Dangerous quirk, navel laser. Dangerous quirk, acid, pink girl. Vigilante. Vigilante, with the glasses. Villain. Vigilante. Dangerous quirk, electricity. Vigilante. Vigilante. Dangerous quirk, something to do with sugar? Villain. 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 Dangerous quirk, shadow monster. Shoto Todoroki, villain, ice, and fire. Villain. Katsuki Bakugo, kukin, villain, explosive sweat. Me. Villain, short, purple guy. Villain, girl with the ponytail. Well, that wasn't much but he wasn't going to learn anything else by sitting in his room. Midoriya sighed deeply, shoved his notebook and pen under his pillow, and braved leaving his room. 
The dorms were eerily quiet. The solemn atmosphere sent shivers down his spine. Everyone else must have been thinking along the same lines as Midoriya, because when he arrived in the common room, he found it was completely empty. They must have retreated to their rooms immediately and hid away, seeing everyone else as villains and all-round dangerous people. But the silence was better than a majority of the alternatives Midoriya could think up on the spot, so he wasn't complaining. He collapsed onto the nearest sofa for a while. The dorms were nice, considering the situation they were all in. Everyone acted like ending up in class A was the end of the world. It was made very clear that finding yourself here was not any sort of prize or thing to aim for. Despite the poster child results from some graduates, a majority don't end up becoming anything significant. Midoriya would rather be anywhere than here. Perhaps the bad reputation came from the UA Sports Festival. The event was world-renowned. Of course, there were plenty of similar contests in other countries, but UA blazed the trail. Essentially, the hero students duke it out and the world has the chance to watch their heroes in the making display awesome power. Usually it's the second and third years you want to watch, this is where the future heroes make their mark. But the first year event was a different spectacle altogether, and this was because of the inclusion of Class 1A. With half the number of competitors, the sports festival for first years might seem less interesting, but when a class of the most promising hero students in all of Japan, are pitched against a group of juvenile delinquents, it really did seem like heroes versus villains. Everyone watching cheered and clapped for Class B, whilst booing and hissing at the grim-faced members of Class A. It was as though you were publicly shamed for ending up there, like a group of clowns who never wanted the job. Perhaps, if Class A weren't portrayed so badly on television, some desperate individuals would get into trouble on purpose to end up in the class. After all, you do get some remarkable opportunities after graduation, namely transferring to UA's other courses. If you make it that far. Midoriya had to get out of here before the sports festival. Before the world saw him as the useless, quirkless, would-be villain that the school seemed to already think he was. He turned on his side, trying to banish the depressing thoughts from his mind. That was when he came face to face with a large whiteboard, spanning the wall opposite the TV, that separated the abandoned kitchen area from the rest of the common room. He got up and wandered towards it, picking up the black pen that lay waiting for him. Spread across half of the whiteboard, he wrote down the student numbers, leaving blank spaces at each. By his, Kikens and Todoroki's numbers, he started writing their full names. As he was writing his own, he heard footsteps. Hesitating on the kanji, he turned, finding himself facing stern number four. He walked right up to him and gazed at the names Midoriya had already added. Nervously, he finished his own writing, before realizing number four's hand was outstretched to him. He gave him the pen, and watched as he added his name. Tinya Itza. He knew that name, he just couldn't pinpoint from where. Putting the pen back down, Itza held his hand back out to Midoriya, Tinya Itza, nice to meet you. With a gulp, Midoriya took his hand and shook it, I Izuka Midoriya, ANU, too. Nice to meet you, I mean. Itza gave him a soft smile and nodded, before turning back to the whiteboard and gazing at the blank spaces. I see you know two of our classmates already, he realized. Oh oh, no, no, just one other. Kaken, I I mean, Bakugo. I've known him, well, forever, really. I just recognized Todoroki, student 15, from the news. Ah, of course. I recognized him too. He doesn't seem particularly pleased to be here. Well, does anyone? Midoriya laughed, rubbing his head nervously. Hmm, I suppose not, Aitsu sighed. But I am thankful I have been given a chance here, at least. I don't know what would have happened if not. Midoriya wavered, he didn't know if it was a good idea to ask yet, but... Um, how did you end up here? I if that's okay to ask. You don't have to answer, I'm just, interested. It's quite alright, Aitsu replied, waving his right hand about in a chopping motion. It's only natural to be curious. I would bet that everyone here has quite the story to tell. Midoriya nervously cast his mind back to his story. No, he still didn't reckon it warranted sending him here. He supposed he would find out why, eventually. Have you, ever heard of the hero killer, Stain? Aitza asked. Yeah, Midoriya answered immediately. Two seconds later, his eyes widened with recognition. Oh, oh, you're. 
Yes, Aitsa sighed again, pushing his glasses further up his nose, that was me. I was foolish, I got what I deserved. Permanent nerve damage in my right hand, and a sentence here, for vigilantism. More noble than me, Midoriya shrugged. And, for what it's worth, I think it was really brave of you, standing up to him for your brother. Aitsa stiffened, and then nodded, thank you, but I don't deserve it. A hero should never act in revenge. But that doesn't stop, the hatred. Yeah. I get it. He cleared his throat, and you? May I ask why you're here? Ah, well, you see. Hi there. The two boys turned. Before anyone could say anything more, a bubbly girl with a brown, bob haircut swooped in between them, picking the whiteboard pen up off the floor, and adding her name to the list. Okako Yurika. This is a cool idea. Calling everyone by numbers feels so, weird, she shuddered. I'm Yurika. Sorry, did I interrupt? Oh oh, no, it's okay. Midoriya stammered. I I am Midoriya, and this is... Tinya Aitsa, greetings. His hand was in that stiff, plank-like position again. Midoriya wondered if that was a result of his nerve damage. It's super nice to meet you, she grinned. Student 5, so, not a dangerous quirk or a vigilante. But, she seemed so nice. Why was she marked as a villain? How's your face, she suddenly asked. Midoriya blinked at her for a moment, my, oh, you mean the scratch. Yeah, fine, recovery girl was nice. She assumed I got into a fight though, she wasn't incredibly happy about it. Yeah, that 17 guy was so mean, she huffed. Ah, yes, you're number 18, Aitsa realized. I recall Mr. Aizawa mentioning there was an issue of sorts between you and 17. Bakugo. Midoriya rubbed his head nervously, um, yeah. We're not the best of friends. Well, I was secretly glad I didn't end up in detention with him, nodded Yurika. I bet you are too. He nodded without hesitation, you have no idea. Todoroki did not lead a good example of the effort we should be putting into this class. Aitsa suddenly snapped, as if he'd been thinking about it all afternoon. He most certainly deserved his detention. I just don't think he wants to be here, Midoriya pointed out. Frankly, I don't believe many of us do wish to be here, the statement was repeated. But that wasn't Yurika, another girl had appeared. She snatched the pen from Yurika's hands and scribbled her name down. Momo Yeyorozu. Ah, it was the girl with the ponytail, that Mr. Aizawa had also told off for not trying hard enough. Unless any of you are exceptions, she asked pointedly. Not really, Midoriya replied quickly, not keen to get on her bad side. She seemed a little less tense after that. Perhaps she was just nervous and didn't show it well. Would, any of you like some tea? It was a rather sudden change in attitude. She went from a menacing, purposely cool sounding person, to someone quite timid and unsure. That would, be nice, Midoriya replied first, despite the fact that he didn't really feel like having tea at the moment. Her smile made it worth it though. I I don't know what's available, she admitted, hurrying over to the kitchen area, but I shall have a look. You know what, said Yurika, maybe this place won't be so bad. Kakin's not back yet, Midoriya reminded them bitterly. Kakin. Aitsa and Yurika repeated simultaneously. Jinx. Yurika yelled. Aitsa didn't understand. Oh oh, I mean Bakugo, number 17? Sorry. I've just called him that ever since we were little kids. It's a habit. Ah, that's sweet. Yurika beamed. I'm going to call him that too. No, no, no. Seriously, he'll kill you. Midoriya warned. There was an evil glint in her eyes, I'm going to do it. He'll also kill me but, to be honest, that's no different than usual, Midoriya moped. I have the tea. Yeyorosa called out. I usually have mine black, does anyone want milk or sugar? It's fine like this, thank you very much, Midoriya smiled as politely as possible. She still kind of frightened him, and the nicer he was, the happier she seemed. Likewise, thank you. Aitsa nodded with a slight bow as he accepted the bland, chip mug that Yeyorozu had obviously found in one of the many cupboards. Aitsa. Yurika exclaimed after accepting her own tea, you're not supposed to speak until I say your name. 
that's how jinxes work. But you just did. Oh, damn it. You all seem so, normal, Midoriya realized, sitting down on the nearest sofa and staring at his reflection in his tea. Sorry, but it's not what I expected. The three of them stared at him for a moment. Yeah, well, Eureka began, I'm not that normal. I'm here for a reason. And I guess everyone else is too. Yeyorosa simply nodded, and Aitsa just looked sad. I'm, not sure why I'm here, Midoriya finally admitted. I've been thinking about it a lot, but... I still don't understand. It's something to do with Kikin, right? Asked Eureka. Midoriya flinched at the nickname, yeah. I guess. Maybe he said something about me to someone, I don't know what. But it's all I can think of at the moment. Hmm, was all Aitsa uttered for a minute or so. Well, I know why I'm here, Eureka admitted, her hands on her hips after she put her mug down on the coffee table. Yeyorosa put a coaster underneath it that seemingly appeared from nowhere as she spoke. And to be honest, it's really not that bad for me. Maybe I'll get somewhere after all this. Anyway. I might have, um, you see, my family's not, that well off. We own a construction business, work wasn't going well. A few machines broke and it all went wrong. I just wanted to help my family and might have resorted to some stuff my parents weren't too proud of when they found out, she explained shyly with a slight laugh. My quirk lets me float stuff, and myself. So, I, air, could get in and out of places others couldn't. You're a thief, Midoriya realized. Sorry, he added quickly, that was rude, I just. She waved the comment off, nah, you're totally right. Might as well admit it. I'm not proud but. I did get enough money to help my parents get the business running properly again. So, there's always that. Not that they realized at the time where I'd got the money. Thought I'd found some well-paid part-time jobs. Which is technically true. It's still honorable, in a way, Midoriya supposed. Yeah, thanks. But wrong, Aitsa added. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, what about you, Aitsa? And so, Aitsa told his story again. Midoriya didn't pay quite as much attention now that he knew the details. He focused more on the fact that, slowly but surely, other people had started to arrive. It couldn't have been long until Kiken and Todoroki returned from their detention either, right? Class A hadn't had their dinner yet, but that might have been because they were waiting until the other two came back. Midoriya wasn't sure how it worked yet. He sat back and watched as more names were added to the board. Soon, it was almost full, and Midoriya was very glad he'd had the idea. Hey. When did everyone come out of their hiding places, called out Pink Skinned Number 2. About half an hour ago, replied Yuriga, allowing Yeyorosa to refill her cup of tea. Ah, man. I should have come down earlier. Oh, I like the board idea, who started that? That would be Midoriya here, announced Aitsa whilst gesturing to him. Number 2 gave him a grin and a thumbs up, adding her name to the board. Mina Ashido. Awesome. Is this super exciting or what? Or, what? Midoriya laughed nervously. Come on. This place is so cool. I've been looking forwards to coming here all year. I gotta say though, that Mr. Aizawa is intense. You were looking forwards to coming here, scoff number 12, Jiro. I agree, it seems rather counterintuitive, said Yeyorozu with a hint of her earlier malice. Not for me. Ashido grinned, for someone with a super tricky, kind of deadly quirk, this is the best place for me. I don't know about you lot, but... Yeah, you clearly don't, Jiro interrupted, twiddling earphone jack-like extensions from her ears around her fingers. So, that was her quirk. Huh? Ashido put her hands on her hips, what's your story then? Jiro rolled her eyes, you eavesdrop on one hero and suddenly you're a danger to society and need to be locked away or something. Midoriya narrowed his eyes, what hero? Like I'm telling you. Last time I went around doing that, I ended up here. It's best to just keep yours and everyone else's secrets to yourself. Super hearing quirk. Midoriya guessed. Jiro's eyes flickered from her earphone jacks and back to Midoriya. She pulled her hands away from them and tucked them into her hoodie, out of sight. Oh, you're quirkless 18, right? Ashido recalled, bounding over to him. It must be weird, 
not having any quirk at all. Midoriya gave her a look, you're the one who's pink and corrosive. She blinked and then laughed, hey, good point. Don't be rude to Midoriya, Aitsa swooped in. I won't hesitate to report any quirkist comments to our teacher. I'm not being rude. Must be weird, not having the ability to control your quirk at all, Yeyorosa suddenly added, sipping her tea nonchalantly. Ashido stared at her, WL, that's why I'm here. So, there. What's your quirk then? I didn't see you use it much during the quirk assessment. Well, wouldn't you like to know? That had gone south awfully quickly. Midoriya was just surprised he'd seemed to make a few friends already, or, maybe allies. People that stood up for him, whatever that meant. It hadn't really happened before. So, Aitsa, Yuriko and Yeyorosa seemed to tolerate him. Ashido, maybe not so much after that. Maybe not Jiro either. He didn't know about any of the others milling around. Todoroki seemed to not want to be involved at all, and Kakan definitely didn't like Midoriya. Maybe he should write all this down later. Midoriya wasn't powerful or any sort of intimidating presence. He hadn't done anything remarkable or had much of a story to tell. If he wanted to do well here, he couldn't just slip into the shadows and ignore everyone, desperate to just survive until the end. If he wanted to graduate, he had to actively prove he deserved it. His best course of action was not to gain strength nor academic prowess. He needed to be, social. Mr. Izawa had said that he and Kiken had to learn to get along if they wanted to graduate. Midoriya knew that wasn't going to happen, but if he could get everyone else, or at least a majority of them, to vouch for him, be on his side, rather than Kiken's, he had a chance. Mr. Izawa would see that he was the victim, he wasn't a villain, he didn't belong here. How low a pH can you make your acid go, Ashido? Midoriya asked. She blinked at him, like, how strong? Yeah, what can it do? Oh. Loads of stuff. It can go through plastic, I can melt like, nearly anything I want. It's hard to control though. That's why I have to wear this disgusting outfit. It's so uncomfortable, she picked at the thick fabric of her long sleeve top and baggy trousers. She wore gloves and covered as much skin as possible. It couldn't hurt to have a little more style at least. It was in that moment that they heard the front door slam open, crashing against the wall, and footsteps march towards them. Great, moment of peace, over. Kaken came into view, and for once, Midoriya dared to not avert his gaze. He refused to be his punching bag this time. This class was full of strong, tough, and stubborn individuals. Midoriya was determined to be the same. What are you looking at, Deku? Kaken snarled. Midoriya just sighed. He was done letting Kaken intimidate him. What are you looking at, Kaken, grinned Eureka, peering over the back of the sofa. What did you just say, round face? Round face, she gasped. Don't be mean, Kaken. Call me that again and I'll kill both of you. Told you, Midoriya shrugged. Todoroki appeared, walking harshly into Kaken's side and knocking shoulders with him. Watch where you're going, you damn popsicle. Kaken yelled, he was not in a good mood, but was he ever. Maybe if you brushed your hair out of your damn eyes you could actually freaking see. But Todoroki just pushed his hair further over his eyes in retaliation. His hair was two-toned, half red and half white. But he'd pushed the white half back, so it covered up most of the red, spiking up and also covering part his face. It must have been rather long, without all that gel in it, and jaggedly cut. Midoriya could just see his famous scar, spanning the hidden half of his face. He looked very different to the missing posters and advertisements that had covered the internet over the last few years. He glanced at the board, noting his name, before turning his gaze to Midoriya, who refused to flinch. But Todoroki didn't hold it for long, before turning and wandering up the stairs to his room, out of sight. What's the freaking board for? Kaken suddenly snapped. So that we all know each other's names. Aitsa proclaimed. It was Midoriya's idea, and a very good one. I must admit. For sure. Eureka beamed, now we don't have to call you 17 all the time, Kaken. He ground his teeth together, let me give you some advice, round face. He pointed an accusing finger at Midoriya, who held his gaze firm, green eyes cold and sure. Don't freaking listen to him. The number thing was his idea, huh? Well then, 
I bet he's got all this copied down in a notebook somewhere. He'll find your strengths and weaknesses and turn them against you, it's all the quirkless bastard can do. Silence flooded the room, and Midoriya glared at Kagan. It had to have been him who got him into class A. Perhaps he accused him of stalking or something, and maybe doing the same to heroes. It wasn't the truth, obviously, but Kakan just loved making his life difficult. It's your own fault if you decide to trust him, or any of you losers. You're all villains, but I'm going to get into class B, and then those idiots will be sorry. And with that, he shoved his hands in his pockets, turned on his heel, and thundered up the stairs. Midoriya sighed, so much for his idea of being liked for once. Who was he kidding? He'd have to try and find some other way out of class A. But then. What's his problem, student 13, Siro, grinned nervously. He's kind of scary, electric Kaminari, student 7, winced. He's so grumpy, huffed Eureka in agreement. Kiri's Hima, number 8, stood up and announced, I'm going to go and try and talk to him. Don't be so righteous, just leave him alone, Siro protested. If he doesn't make an effort with us, why should we make an effort with him? I vote we just ignore him for a week, Jiro grinned. Maybe he'll calm down after that. Kiri's Hima simply shrugged and went after Kikin anyway. But Midoriya was stunned. He'd never seen anyone else stand up to Kikin like that. And after everything he'd just said about him. I don't get it, he laughed nervously. H he just. He might have been the big bad at your old school, Yurika interjected, but I don't think it works like that here. He did really well in the quirk test, but I don't think any of us are going to gang up with him just because he's strong. Plus, Aitza did better. It's not right to judge any of us by the means in which we arrived here, said Aitza, standing up to collect empty cups. It would be hypocritical. I'm not sure what to make of what Bakugo said about you, Midoriya, but unlike him, you made an effort. I respect you for that. You um, thanks. So, you're like, super smart, yeah. Ashido grinned, leaning over the sofa towards him. Midoriya inched away, I I don't. You analyze stuff. Isn't that what the mean guy said about strengths and weaknesses or something, she guessed. Well, why yes, but I. What about me? Can you analyze me, can you help me with my quirk? I I might need a little more time. Midoriya admitted standing up. He hesitated and gazed around at his, classmates. Are you seriously, not bothered by what Keikakan just said? We're in class A, dude, Jiro reminded him, flopping into the place he'd just left on the sofa. Who cares? I always speak my mind, spoke up croaky number 3, Ajui, as she hopped towards him. And I would like to point out that out of you and Bakugo, you are far more tolerable, Ribbit. Thank you. Midoriya replied unsurely. What he said just makes me want you to not hate me, like you hate him. I I don't hate he wavered, okay, yeah, and maybe I do, just a little. A lot, Ribbit. B but why would I hate you? We're in class A, she reminded him, holding a finger to her chin in a thoughtful manner, anything's possible. Like you being here. Eureka interjected, grinning at Ajui, you seem so nice. It's a long story. Well, we're happy to hear whenever you're happy to tell it. Thank you. Maybe another time, Ribbit. Sure. Wanna sit? There's space. Midoriya was still struggling to believe what had just happened. Out of all the places he expected to find blind acceptance, and he found it in a class full of villains. If this is what it means to be a villain. Then why did he ever want to be a hero? Chapter 3, Why Are You Like This? Midoriya struggled to sleep on the first night of UA. The light pouring under his door from the hallway made it hard to keep his eyes shut, but if he turned it off, he risked the wrath of student 14's shadow monster quirk. Just thinking about it in the middle of the night only made things worse. The unfamiliarity of his room made him uncomfortable, but not as much as the tracker anklet did. They all had to wear one at all times, and they couldn't take it off. It was waterproof and surprisingly thin, so unnoticeable under clothing. But the feeling of it against his skin, however slight it was, still made him itch and fidget. He'd also noticed that different people had slightly altered designs. Todoroki's and Kikin's were thicker and of a different material, perhaps fireproofing so they couldn't melt it off. The same must have applied to Ashido, 
but she wore clothing that covered as much of her skin as possible, meaning the anklet was hidden from sight. Kamineri's was different again, maybe to stop him from short-circuiting it. Of course, Midoriya had already tried prizing his off, but it wouldn't budge. The anklet had more purpose than just keeping an eye on their whereabouts. Whilst most students needed a student ID to get through the gates to UA without the defenses being activated, and barricades appearing from seemingly nowhere to stop intruders, the anklets did the exact opposite. They activated the barricades if they tried to leave. Moreover, with the principal being able to see their exact positions at all times on a digital map of the school, Midoriya felt even more uncomfortable. But he must have slept eventually, or else he couldn't have been awoken by the shrill sound of the alarm clock that he hadn't set himself. The wake-up call was so ear-piercing that he almost fell out of bed. It didn't help that he could just hear everyone else's alarms go off at exactly the same time, despite the thick walls, and a chorus of groggy moans and complaints filled the dorm. Wanting to get to the bathrooms first, as to avoid as many awkward interactions as possible, Midoriya got into his uniform in a hurry, and practically ran downstairs to brush his teeth and wash up. Not shower though, he'd do that in the evenings, again, to avoid awkward morning interactions. Last night, they'd been supplied dinner by Lunch Rush, a hero who doubled as a brilliant cook. But Mr. Izawa was quick to inform them that from now on, they'd have to cook dinner themselves. Breakfast was for individuals to organize, and lunch was free for them, Yuriko was the most ecstatic about that idea, specifically by the word free. Whilst everyone else slowly but surely set about their new morning routine, Midoriya was well ahead of the game. He'd scoff breakfast before most of his classmates even appeared to go to the bathrooms, but he made sure to wait until he'd definitely seen Kikin turn up, before risking going up the stairs. He didn't want to pass him because that gambled a quick trip back down the stairs, and another visit to recovery girl. After the danger had passed, he returned to his room to gather what he thought he might need for the day. In his yellow backpack, artfully decorated with hand-shaped scorch marks, he shoved his slightly tattered PE kit, his pencil case and two of his notebooks, one empty, and one partially filled with information on the rest of Class 1A. He'd simply titled it A in a massive, bold letter that smothered the entirety of the front cover in splodgy, red ink. He'd only had a day, so the information was still rather lacking. He took it back downstairs, and was able to finally add everyone's names, since a few were still missing last night, and he couldn't quite remember how to spell all of them. In fact, the only name that wasn't on the board by the morning was Kikin since he'd clearly rubbed it off in spite. But Midoriya watched as Yuriko wrote in its place Kikin. In the tackiest writing possible. He'd had to correct her spelling of the name, which gave her fits of giggles. She sat down next to him whilst she ate her toast. Midoriya had to angle his arm to make sure she couldn't see what he was writing and drawing. Having her sitting next to him was the perfect opportunity to add a sketch. He used to do that all the time with heroes, his villainous classmates were no different. With all the practice, he'd gotten quite good at drawing. But he'd learned the hard way to keep his notes private. Kikin burnt them all up whenever he caught a glimpse. Speaking of which, he was practically smoldering in anger when he wiped Yurika's writing off the board. At 8.20 am exactly, Mr. Izawa unlocked the doors to the dorm to escort them all up to the classroom. Midoriya had thought he'd let them all make their own way to class, since that was what happened on day one. Perhaps Todoroki's incident yesterday, when he decided not to leave the changing rooms, had convinced Mr. Izawa to take extra precautions. Midoriya was sure that later in the year, their teacher would just unlock the doors and meet them at their classroom later on. We will be starting ordinary lessons today, their drab homeroom teacher explained. Some of your teachers may give you short tests to assess your abilities in each subject. We don't expect you all to be of a similar level, given your different backgrounds. Once they know what you know, they'll be able to alter the course to better benefit you all. So, actually try in these tests, it'll make it easier for everyone in the long run. Don't make me give out more detentions on the second day. To everyone's surprise, including Mr. Izawa's, someone then actually raised their hand. Yes, seven. If I'm just so bad at everything that it doesn't look like I'm trying, will I still get detention? Kaminari asked with a sly grin. A few others around the classroom suppressed their laughter. But Midoriya was more interested in what their teacher would. I'll be the judge of that, he snapped, and the class fell silent once more. Mr. Izawa had the uncanny ability to keep even the rowdiest group under his complete control. Midoriya didn't know quite what it was about him, 
but no one dared put a foot wrong in his presence. He didn't exactly look like the sharpest, strictest person in the world, but something about his very existence, and his piercing glare, made even the toughest student cower in their place. However, not all of the teachers of UA had the same intensity. Welcome to class 1A, little listeners. Yeah, yeah. Midori grimaced and covered his ears, he wasn't the only one. Even Mr. Izawa was quick to try and make his leave when their new English teacher, the overly energetic hero, present Mike, burst into the room. Any instructions, Izawa? Just don't try them, he sighed, and slipped out the door, dragging his sleeping bag along behind him. You got it? Present Mike exclaimed, giving his colleague a thumbs up as he disappeared. Now, who's ready for some? Hey, could you tone it down a little? Everyone stared at Midoriya. He swallowed, as some of us have sensitive ears, and he gestured to Jiro, sitting not that far in front of him. You got it, little listener. Present Mike grinned, now only at a slightly above average volume. Midoriya didn't fail to notice the shocked look upon Jiro's face, and the soft smile that she developed soon after, whilst present Mike was handing out empty exercise books. Midoriya smiled too, that's one more person who didn't hate him. Mr. Izawa had been right about the pop quizzes. English wasn't Midoriya's strongest subject, but that wasn't the end of the world. By the looks on some of his classmates' faces, he wasn't struggling nearly as much as they were when faced with all the grammar and vocabulary present Mike threw at them. When they'd finished, Aitza volunteered to collect the exercise books back in. Present Mike sat back and watched whilst Aitza wandered around the classroom like any other normal person would do to collect the books. But apparently, this was not normal behavior for Class 1A. It's been a while since Class A was so civil towards each other so early. Present Mike almost laughed. And in such a strange group too. Why are we strange? Ajui asked immediately, doing that thing where she prodded her chin with her finger, it seemed to be a habit. Lot more vigilantes than usual. And some cool quirks, or lack of. Midoriya narrowed his eyes at him, trying to ignore the glances in his direction. You know, you're the first person without a quirk to ever attend UA, 18. Present Mike announced. Great, so they'd been talking about him in the staff room. Well, it was to be expected. The staff had likely had a lengthy conversation about every member of Class A. Perhaps Mr. Izawa had instructed them all to call them by numbers during the meeting as well. It had to be some sort of twisted teaching method. Then why am I here? Midoriya dared to ask. The class fell silent like it did only in the presence of Mr. Izawa. Midoriya wondered how many others had quietly asked the same question about him to themselves. Kakan scoffed but didn't say anything. Midoriya glared daggers at the back of his head, what's so funny? You know exactly why you're here, Deku, he hissed. Midoriya wasn't going to cower down in front of Kakan anymore. He'd said it before, but he'd say it again, even if only to convince himself, but he'd had enough. In a class full of villains, he refused to be so weak. If I knew I wouldn't ask. You think you're so freaking smart, but you're actually as much of an idiot as the rest of them, Kakan snarled back. This classroom doesn't work that way, Kakan, you can't intimidate people into liking you. Has anyone ever told you that your personality reeks like if someone set the sewers on fire? Kaminari butted in. What did you just say? Kakan yelled, standing up and pushing his chair back so that it hit the front of Midoriya's desk in the process. Well, we only just met you, so it's quite telling, Ribbit, added Ajui. I'll kill all of you. Hey, settle down started present Mike. Yurika took the opportunity, yeah, calm down, Kakan. You might want to take back that comment about us being civilized, sir, Ciro laughed. Kakan slammed his hands onto Midoriya's desk, letting smoke hiss out from underneath them, this is all your fault. And we're back to berating Midoriya again, leave him alone, man, said Jiro. What did he ever do wrong? Look at his freaking stalker notebooks and think again, he shouted, grabbing Midoriya's bag before he even realized what was happening. Hey, give that back. Midoriya stood up and lunged forwards, but Kakan had already retrieved the notebook marked A, and Midoriya regretted labeling it so soon. Just try and take it from me. But present Mike now had his hand on Kikin's shoulder, and a disappointed look upon his face, come on, little listener, give the notebook back. I don't want to have to give out detentions. I'm the cool teacher. 
Kikin gritted his teeth and chucked the notebook at Midoriya's feet. There, now it matched every other notebook he'd ever used. There was a nice set of burnt fingerprints on the cover. They sat back down, and Aitza finally handed present Mike the pile of numbered exercise books. Aitza gave Midoriya a sympathetic glance before making his way back to his own desk. So, what was the notebook? Midoriya gulped at present Mick's question as he slid the item back into his bag. He was going to have to admit that Kikin was right, and all the good relationships he'd forged would be void. It's one of your analysis books, right? Pink-skinned Ashido perked up with a smile. Midoriya blinked at her in surprise, air, yeah. Her smile grew wider, he does quirk analysis, sir, she explained. He's going to help me with mine. I I never he hesitated. Last night, Kikin had ranted about his notebooks again. Ashido picked up on it and asked if he could analyze her quirk to help her out. It must have meant a lot to her. He thought Ashido wasn't that fond of him, but this might help amend that. Yeah, eventually. She beamed. I, used to analyze heroes and stuff a lot, Midoriya admitted, absent-mindedly brushing away the scorch marks on his desk, it was a hobby, I guess. Did you ever write about me? Present Mike asked, pointing a thumb at himself and grinning. Midoriya had, although it was a while ago. If he were still much of a hero fan, he would have freaked out about having him as his English teacher. He used to listen to his radio show all the time. In fact, he was still secretly excited about meeting all these heroes, even though he'd tried to hide it. He just hadn't figured out who Mr. Izawa was yet. Air, yeah, I think so, Midoriya shrugged. Come on, what about my strengths and weaknesses? I would say do it in English, but that's harsh, so think of this as a little public speaking exercise. Midoriya wasn't quite sure what to do. People usually weren't that interested in what he had to say, especially in terms of this kind of stuff. He started mumbling about his quirk and all his strengths, fiddling with his thumbs and never really meeting anyone's eyes. Kikin seemed to be stewing in his anger in silence, which was the only thing which encouraged Midoriya to keep going. Hey. You know your stuff, little listener. Present Mike exclaimed, I'm impressed. Midoriya smiled. People hardly ever complimented him about all this. They usually found it creepy. Oh, what about his weaknesses, asked Invisible Hagakure. Yeah. Come on, how do we take him down, laughed Ashido. Present Mike waved it off, the best heroes keep their weaknesses a secret. There's no way he knows about. Midoriya smiled, and deadpanned, insects. And most of the class turned to the hero with identical, toothy grins, as a single bead of sweat fell from his forehead. The bell sounded. And that's the end of your first lesson. Present Mike barked, still looking rather worried for his general well-being. You have maths in 10 minutes so have fun. Are you scared of bugs? Asked Jiro. Signing off now, bye, bye. And he slammed the door shut behind him. A couple of seconds passed before the class burst into laughter. By the time their maths teacher, Mr. Ectoplasm, arrived, Kaminari and Ashido had already cooked up half a dozen pranks for poor present Mike, and Midoriya was smiling so much that it hurt. A tough morning of surprise exams passed them by, and soon enough, class 1A was off down to lunch. Midoriya found it kind of funny, watching how different friendship groups were already being forged. With the whole pranking present Mike idea, Kaminari and Ashido had gotten talking. Kaminari had dragged along Siro, and Ashido had roped in Kiri's Hima, who appeared to already know her from outside UA. Kiri's Hima seemed to be a genuinely nice person. He was the only one who made much of an effort with Kikin, despite the fact that he was still calling him weird hair. And so, Kiri's Hima dragged Kikin along to this group of energetic pranksters, who were still animatedly calling him names, and he was doing so in return. It was, strangely nice to see. Midoriya found himself spending more time with Aitsa and Yuriko, since they were the first to actually talk to him. But now Yeyorozu and Ajui, please, call Mitsu, were tagging along as well. Midoriya couldn't remember a time when he'd found himself in a group of people who seemed to actually like him. Friends, they were, friends, right? It had been a while since he'd actually had friends, if ever. He'd come to learn that Kikin didn't count, and he never had. A lot of quirkest people out there, Ribbit, Ajui, Tsu, croaked. My brother had a problem with some of his classmates. They'd make fun of him. 
I stepped in when they started leaving dead frogs in his locker. Oh, that's horrible. Eureka gasped. It was, she agreed. I went to the head teacher and he gave the bullies some stern words, but it didn't help, Ribbit. They got angry that he told someone about it all. He started coming home covered in bruises, so I followed him around until I caught them in the act and confronted them, Ribbit. They attacked so I defended, but no one believed me. I think one of the boys' family gave quite a few generous donations to the school in the past, so when they reported me, the school backed him up and I was punished for it. Yayo Rosa frowned, and you ended up here just because of that. Not exactly, Ribbit. It kept happening, and I kept stepping in. One day, I think hurt someone. Or maybe they made it up. The school had to act somehow, but they didn't want me locked up as a villain, so it was filed as vigilantism. The head teacher forwarded the case to UA, and they accepted me. It's not the best outcome, but I suppose it could have been worse. Agreed. And the boys faced some consequences too, two of them were expelled. But I can't protect my brother anymore or contact him. I hope he's okay, Ribbit. You did a very honorable thing, Ajui, Aitsa nodded in respect. I've told you to call Mitsu. Eureka groaned loudly as they joined the lunch queue, you guys are all so cool. And I'm here for something, way less cool. You haven't heard my story yet, Yayo Rosa sighed, I suppose I'll have to explain in due course. Only when you want to, Aitsa insisted. Thank you. Midoriya had remained silent throughout, listening, but also casting an eye towards a few people a little further up the queue. They kept giving them sideways glances. It wasn't hard to notice the red bands or the large numbers on their blazers, they were clearly class 1A. So, who were they? Todoroki was just ahead of them, standing alone. He was a hostile and abrasive individual, in a vastly different way to Kaken. Midoriya hadn't quite figured him out yet. But right now, he was looking at the same group of people that Midoriya was, and there was a look of disgust in his eyes which seemed to indicate that he knew them. A blonde boy with dull eyes and a cocky smile turned his head. Todoroki immediately averted his gaze, but the damage was done. Well, hello there, number 15, the other boy said with a laugh. Are you planning on washing up after us again tonight? Or will Yue just lock you up with the other villains until morning? Class 1B, Midoriya muttered, and the other four immediately locked gaze with the opposing class. It was the first time they'd met, but Todoroki and Kaken both received detention last night, and were tasked on washing up after Class B's dinner. Todoroki didn't say a word, trying to ignore him completely. Oh, come on, the boy grinned. I'm just trying to strike up a conversation. You could have been in our class, once upon a time. I'm just extending the hospitality of UA. You should be glad they let you within a mile of this place. How rude, Aitsa spoke up, but none of them were brave enough to step in. Perhaps Tsu's story about the fallbacks of standing up for people had struck a chord. You have an incredible power, being the son of the number two hero, he leered, stepping closer to Todoroki and reaching out to him, it's such a shame to see it go to waste. Todoroki slapped his hand away, back off, he snarled. The hero student pursed his lips for a moment, before glancing down at the hand Todoroki had knocked away. He clicked his fingers, and a flame began to burn, so, you can use fire, interesting. In all the encounters shown on the news, you'd only ever used ice. Why hide a part of who you are? He let the fire grow brighter, catching the eyes of a few other students around him, so it wouldn't have been strange for Midoriya to continue watching carefully. The hero student held out his other hand, and let ice crystals form over it, half ice, have fire. You would have been the perfect. Stop it, Todoroki interrupted, leaning in closer, you don't know what you're talking about. I know quirks, he sighed, not people. But it is a shame, I know your quirk better than you do. A copy quirk, Midoriya realized. It was an incredible power, Midoriya would have done anything to have something like that, but it was not to be. That didn't mean he was powerless though. No, not against a copy quirk. Midoriya made his move, stepping forwards to Todoroki's side. If you plan on being a hero, you should first figure out how to be a good person, he snapped. He narrowed his eyes, and who might you be, ah, uh, another villain. Who are you, he tilted his head to try and catch a glimpse of the number on Midoriya's back, 18, I see. I'm Minoma, class 1B. 
I figured, Midoriya replied. Can you please leave us alone? We didn't do anything wrong. On the contrary, the boy, Minoma, laughed. Why do you think you're here? It was a question Midoriya had been asking himself a lot, but he decided to take a leaf out of Yeyoroza's book in this situation, wouldn't you like to know, he hissed. He simply laughed again, oh, I can always find out. I always find a way. He stepped a little closer to Midoriya, holding an icy hand over his heart, I am a hero, and you are a villain. Which side do you think the school is really on? Midoriya saw Todoroki flinch as Minoma rested his hand on Midoriya's shoulder. He must have come to the same conclusion Midoriya had, the quirk was activated through touch. The ice cracked away and left a chill behind. Is that a threat? Yeyorosa spoke up. Midoriya hated Minoma's laugh, you villains are always quick to start a fight. We're just having a civilized conversation here. He turned back to Midoriya, pulling his hand away. Now, what about you? I suppose I didn't make my query clear. Why are you here? What is your power? He looked down at his hands and stared for a moment, and then frowned. Midoriya let a smile creep across his face whilst Minoma grew increasingly confused. His eyes darted from Midoriya and back to his hand. After a few seconds, he turned around and grabbed his ginger-haired friend by the arm, who hadn't been paying attention to the interaction at all. Midoriya guessed that he was trying to copy her quirk, already being familiar with it. Minoma, what are you doing, she questioned, her hands on her hips after she pulled away from him. Minoma just looked back to his hands, breath now frantic, what did you do, he asked Midoriya. Realizing his assumption had been correct, Midoriya began his charade, a copy quirk, right? You make contact with someone, and you copy their power. That is bound to have some limitations, is it one power at a time? Or as many as you want, with a time limit on each? Can you combine quirks, or do you have to switch one off and another on, he questioned thoughtfully, genuinely interested. What did you do, he repeated, seemingly rather frightened. Now, Midoriya could have just explained that he'd copied his quirk, which, of course, was nothing. But he had a better idea. Well, our abilities seem to fundamentally contradict one another, Midoriya sighed. He turned and started to pace back and forth. Can you at least answer my question? Is there a time limit? Hey, what just happened, frowned the ginger girl with the ponytail, clearly ready to step in if something was going wrong. They'd gathered quite an audience too. He did something to my quirk. Minoma accused, his calm composure lost to the wind. Well, it's your own fault, Midoriya shrugged. He walked around behind Todoroki, and whispered hastily to him, freeze my arm, quickly. Todoroki seemed unsure, but thankfully, didn't question it. He brushed his hand against Midoriya, and with a sudden chill, Midoriya's hand was as frozen as Minoma's had been, ice crystals quickly melting against warm skin and trickling down his palm. Minoma stared. It is a cool quirk, both of yours are. That's, my quirk, Minoma gaped with wide eyes. You took my quirk. Give it back. Tell me how long your time limit is, Midoriya insisted, brushing away the ice. And I'll think about it. Minoma gritted his teeth, five minutes per quirk. Ah, cool, and can you combine them? No, now give it back to me. He reached forwards as though to snatch something out of the air. Midoriya just gave him a look, it doesn't work like that. You won't need contact when you get it back. It just needs to be released. You'll have it in, five minutes. Hey, give it back, the ginger girl ordered. It's not funny, you're frightening him. And it's not funny to have a go at us either. We didn't choose to be here, at least, most of us didn't. Stop having a go at us for being in your school, and we'll stop getting in your way, deal. Fine. Minoma exclaimed, just give me my quirk back. He said five minutes, Todoroki breathed. He must have caught onto Midoriya's trick. Keep asking and it'll be ten. He snapped his mouth shut, and silence fell over them all. You wanna eat lunch with us, Todoroki? Midoriya asked whilst everyone continued to stare. He hesitated, and then shrugged, sure, but don't call me that. Oh, okay, but I can't just call you fifteen. Shoto is fine. Oh okay. The crowd parted as the group of villains rejoined the lunch queue. In fact, there wasn't a queue, 
they let them go right to the front. Eureka just hummed along to a tune in her head and followed suit, not bothered at all by the situation. The only one who seemed at all worried was Itza, who didn't speak up about it for a while. That was very brave, Ribbit, Chsu voiced when they finally sat down, somewhere far away from everyone else. Midoriya sighed in relief, I it was kind of scary. You were kind of scary. Eureka exclaimed. But also, really cool, that was smart. It was, Yeyorosa nodded, I don't think I would have thought of it. I don't get it though, you are quirkless, right, said Eureka, picking at her food. Why yeah, I am, Midoriya answered, rubbing his head shyly. But I realized he had a copy quirk and um, well, if he tried to copy quirklessness, I thought that maybe, he'd copy having nothing, which would mean he couldn't turn his quirk on or off or do anything until his timer ran out. There had to be a timer, it made the most sense. I was a little doubly worried there wasn't for a moment. So, that's why he thought you took his quirk. Eureka gasped. Wasn't there an old villain with a power like that or something? Whatever, now he thinks your quirk is stealing others. Because he didn't anticipate someone in the school being quirkless, Yeyorozu finished. Todoroki didn't say a thing. He simply sat there and noisily slurped his noodles. Midoriya figured he wasn't the type for much social interaction, which he could relate to. I don't think antagonizing the hero class was a wise idea, Aitsa finally spoke up. They are our betters and we shouldn't. They aren't our betters, Midoriya quickly interrupted. Don't talk yourself down like that, Aitsa. You'll transfer soon enough. That's why you're here, right? He hesitated, before clearing his throat and continuing, this may come back to haunt you. Midoriya simply shrugged, why do you think I'm here? And they all fell silent again, filled only by the sound of Todoroki eating. Midoriya stared at his rice, thinking over what he just said. Why do you think I'm here? I've had a complaint from class 1B today, Mr. Izawa announced at the end of the day, and Midoriya shrunk into his seat. About one of their most promising students having their quirk taken away from them and being threatened by you, 18. Midoriya felt all their eyes on the back of his head. Care to explain? Mr. Izawa asked, raising his eyebrows. I I um, may have, fake taking his quirk, he admitted sheepishly. He has a copy ability and he copied my quirklessness so I thought that maybe I could trick him, but I didn't mean to scare him so much. I just... Calm down, the teacher sighed, rubbing his temples, I can't process if you're speaking that fast. It's not his fault, Todoroki, no, Shoto, suddenly interjected. Everyone stared at him. No one could have expected him to speak up. He glanced around the room, suddenly seeming a lot less cold and unforgiving, and a little more, human. Manoma was, antagonizing me, and Midoriya stepped in. Mr. Izawa led along, hard moment of silence hold the atmosphere in an iron grip, 18, he began. At his name, Midoriya flinched and cowered. Mr. Izawa continued, you need to understand that fabricated strengths, can quickly become very real weaknesses. The tension left Midoriya's shoulders, and he sat up a little straighter, confused. Class B will target you because of this, his teacher explained, you will all be attending several classes together, and Manoma won't forget what you did. He'll catch on eventually. Midoriya gulped, yes, sir, sorry. Sir. You also need to realize that the lack of a quirk, isn't a weakness, you all need to understand that. Mr. Izawa gazed around the classroom. Midoriya stared back at him with wide eyes. Quirklessness isn't a weakness, he repeated, it is just the lack of a strength. You have plenty of other strengths, Midoriya. You don't need to cover up and hide. If you step back and really look at it, you can find power in what you think is powerlessness. He just, used his name. But if you do something like this again, it's detention in class B's dorm, get it, problem child. Why yes, sir. Sorry, again. Good. When the day came to a close, and Midoriya once again rested his head against his pillow, he realized he was still smiling. Midoriya slept well on the second night of UA. All right, that's where we'll leave off for the day. Thanks so much for listening along with me today. If you enjoyed please like and comment down below. It really helps with the algorithms. I look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao for now, lovelies.